Hello, welcome back to the History Sphere. What you're about to hear is part eight of a long winding series on the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. If you're the sort of person that likes to have the full context of a story, you may want to go back and listen to those earlier episodes. If you're comfortable joining us in the middle of the story and you don't need the full context, you're of course welcome to stick around. Last time, I covered the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941 as Nazi Germany destroyed Soviet armies and advanced to the very gates of Moscow, where they were turned back by a daring Soviet counteroffensive. This week, I will cover the events of the Battle of Stalingrad, where the tide of the war was turned and the long march towards Soviet victory began. This is The End of History, Part 8. In the summer of 2013, over a long holiday weekend, I don't recall exactly which holiday, I took a train from Moscow, where I was living at the time, to the city of Volgograd in southern Russia. If you're not familiar with Volgograd, that's a forgivable oversight. The city is far more famous by another name, which it bore from 1925 to 1961, Stalingrad. On the train to Volgograd, I befriended a group of young men about my age, maybe a couple years younger. They were Russian soldiers on leave from their compulsory military service. We were seated in the same compartment, and we talked for several hours. It's a long ride from Moscow to Volgograd. My Russian was probably as good as it has ever been that summer, but occasionally one of them would chuckle and correct my grammar, or the one who knew a little bit of English would chime in to clarify something. I don't recall all the details of the conversation, but they were all very curious about America and they wanted to hear my thoughts about life in Russia as an American. At some point, the conversation topic changed to where we were heading and why. They were also heading to Volgograd, and for the same reason as me, to visit the historic battlefield and memorial. For them, the significance of the trip was much different than it was for me. The way they talked about it bore resemblance to a kind of religious pilgrimage. As Russian soldiers, they saw themselves as the heirs of the traditions of the heroic Red Army that had triumphed there. It was at Stalingrad, I remember one of them telling me, that the Russian people saved the world. These young soldiers were less interested in the Battle of Stalingrad than they were in its mythical significance to the foundations of the modern Russian nation. In the West, too, especially in the United States, the Second World War has been completely mythologized, and its heroes canonized as saints in the American civic religion. But as with the scale of the war itself, the mythologizing of the war in Russia is much, much bigger. It's almost impossible to overemphasize how central the mythology of the Second World War is to modern Russian patriotism, Every May, Russians celebrate Victory Day on the anniversary of Nazi Germany's surrender. This holiday is difficult to describe, but the best I can do is to say it's kind of like the 4th of July, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade all wrapped into one. The heroic victory at Stalingrad is central to the mythology that the war is wrapped in in modern Russia. The reality of Stalingrad in some ways justifies this mythology. The Battle of Stalingrad was an incredibly important one, and it marked a turning point in the war. A lot of historians count Stalingrad as the most decisive battle in the war, and even in all of world history. It was also the site of some of the most concentrated human suffering and misery in the history of our species. The monuments that exist in memorial to the battle in present-day Volgograd are steeped in patriotic mythology, and they sanitize this reality. Of the roughly 500,000 Red Army soldiers sent to defend the city from the initial German thrust in August 1942, 300,000 would not survive the battle. Keep in mind, that's not the total casualty count. That's just those who were killed. And that's just the initial batch of troops sent to hold the meat grinder in Stalingrad. In total, it's estimated that over a million Soviet citizens, soldiers and civilians, were killed in the Battle of Stalingrad. One division, the 13th Guards Rifle Division of the Red Army, entered Stalingrad in August 1942, 10,000 strong. When the battle ended in February 1943, 
only about 300 of these soldiers remained alive. And this unit was on the winning side. The Germans, too, lost nearly a million men in Stalingrad. This was, by raw numbers, fewer than the Soviets, but the cold arithmetic of war would prove the German losses much harder to replace. It's easy in hindsight to dehumanize these Germans as jackbooted Nazi thugs, which many of them were, but they were also human beings. Like the Soviet soldiers and civilians who they slaughtered, they had hopes and dreams and loved ones waiting and praying for them back home. Most of them were ordinary young men who happened to be born in Germany in the 1920s. Their deaths and their suffering were also tragic, and we do ourselves a disservice by forgetting this. They're a tragic example of how easily ordinary people can become tools of evil, and it's a lesson I think we forget at our own peril. 1942 was the year of deep war. Defeat had been fought off in the snows outside Moscow, but there was still no sign of victory. The German Blitzkrieg campaign of 1941 had failed, and in the attempt, the Germans lost about a million men. In 1942, they no longer had the strength to attack along the whole of the Eastern Front. The German High Command, therefore, settled on a campaign in the south of Russia. Their goal was to drive east to the Volga River capture the strategically important city of Stalingrad, and cut the Caucasus off from the rest of the country. Then, the Germans would thrust deep into the Caucasus, capturing the vital oil fields of Grozny and Baku. To understand the strategy, you have to understand a little bit about the geography of Russia. I'll try to put some maps up on the website for anybody who's interested. The Volga is the largest river in Europe, and a massive natural barrier. It flows from the lake country of northern Russia all the way through European Russia until it finally empties into the Caspian Sea. Historically, it's one of the main economic highways on the Eurasian landmass, along which trade has flowed between northern Europe and the cities of the Middle East and Central Asia along the Caspian Sea. The trade and economic activity along the Volga was crucial to the development of the Russian state in the Middle Ages, and continues to be a crucial economic highway and symbol of Russian nationhood to this day. Volgograd, Stalingrad, sits on high ground overlooking a large westward bend in the river. Whoever controls Stalingrad can control or stop the flow of trade along the Volga River. It was crucial to the German strategy. The Soviets had no idea about the Germans' southern strategy, and Stalin, along with his military commanders, assumed that the Germans would try to finish what they'd started in 1941 and drive toward Moscow. Therefore, most of the Soviet efforts at defensive preparation were focused in and around Moscow, not in the South. The Soviet strategy in the South was, in early 1942, almost wholly offensive. Stalin believed that the successful Soviet counteroffensive that winter had broken the German army, and that a successful spring offensive could end the war. He focused on a salient in the German line around the Ukrainian city of Kharkov. Kharkov being the Russian pronunciation, the city is often referred to today by its Ukrainian name, Kharkiv. The Soviet generals knew that the German army was far from broken, and they attempted to dissuade Stalin from the offensive, or at the very least, to scale it back. But Stalin thought he knew better. He could not be dissuaded. What followed was the disastrous Kharkov Offensive of May 1942. A fresh Soviet army of about a quarter million men drove toward Kharkov. At first, they appeared to make great progress, and Stalin urged them on, convinced that their rapid advance was proof that he was right about the German army. But it was a trap. The Soviets were allowed to advance deep into Axis-held territory. Finally, the Germans counterattacked, cutting off and surrounding the Soviets, most of whom were forced to surrender. This failed offensive played right into the German strategy, as the Soviets had sacrificed the only army capable of halting the German drive to the Volga, which began in late June. The Soviets were forced into a strategic retreat, falling back hundreds of miles in the face of the massive German offensive. Just as the Red Army had done in 1941, they conducted a scorched earth campaign, destroying anything that could be of use to the Germans as they retreated. 
This, of course, served to make life much harder for the civilians in the areas now occupied by the Germans. One such civilian was 11-year-old Mikhail Gorbachev. He later recalled that this was the hungriest he'd ever been. He was alone when the Germans arrived, as his father had been called up to serve at the front, and his mother had gone to a neighboring village in hope of finding food there. At first he wasn't afraid of the Germans, but rather excited by the frenzied activity of it all. The first Germans he met, he recalled, were very friendly. He recalled that one of them gave him chocolate. Later, when people from his village were suspected of supporting the partisans, the Germans hung a dozen hostages in the village square, forcing the entire village to watch as a warning to anyone considering resistance to the occupation. After that, young Mikhail learned to fear and loathe the German occupiers. By August 23rd, the German 6th Army, which had marched triumphantly through the streets of Paris in 1940, reached the outskirts of Stalingrad. Realizing the strategic significance of Stalingrad and the Volga River, Stalin had decreed in July his infamous Order No. 227, which decreed that Soviet soldiers were to take not one step back. Essentially, this order clarified what was already understood by the Red Army soldiers to be the official policy that anybody who retreated from the Germans without authorization was subject to criminal penalties, including the death penalty. The Red Army even created so-called blocking units, which were meant to stand in the rear of their own troops and keep them from retreating. If you've seen the 2001 movie Enemy at the Gates, which depicts the Battle of Stalingrad and is indeed one of the only Hollywood movies that I'm aware of that depicts the fighting on the Eastern Front at all, then you'll be familiar with the famous scene depicting a wave of Red Army soldiers sent rushing into a stupid attack on an entrenched German position and then being slaughtered by a blocking unit, mowing them down with machine gun fire as they attempt to run away. This scene is nonsense. It took the all-too-real concept of blocking units, a real thing that absolutely existed, and turned the dial up to 11. Examples of blocking units slaughtering their own men wholesale like this were rare, if they happened at all. The point of the blocking units was to keep the soldiers in the fight, not to kill them. Don't get me wrong, some soldiers absolutely were executed for unauthorized retreating, but the death penalty was actually used rather sparingly, at least compared to the way it was depicted in Enemy at the Gates. More often, the punishment for this so-called cowardice was assignment to a penal battalion. In many cases, such an assignment was as good as a death sentence, as these units were often deployed on suicide missions, but these suicide missions usually served a military purpose. If a soldier serving in a penal battalion was killed or badly wounded, their crime would be considered, quote, atoned for with blood, end quote. If they recovered from their wounds, then they would return to their normal unit without any further punishment or black marks on their military record. A desire for redemption often motivated the soldiers in the penal battalions to act with extreme bravery. The Soviet policy of no retreat, while it was incredibly brutal, was also effective. The Soviet soldiers in Stalingrad implanted themselves into their urban environment and turned every building into a fortress. A German soldier, Wilhelm Hoffmann, wrote, quote, Our regiment is involved in constant heavy fighting. You don't see them at all. They've established themselves in houses and cellars and are firing on all sides, including from our rear. Barbarians. They use gangster methods. The Russians have stopped surrendering at all. If we take any prisoners, it's because they're hopelessly wounded and can't move themselves. Stalingrad is hell. End quote. Hundreds of buildings were fortified and turned into miniature versions of the Alamo, where Soviet soldiers fought to the death, and the Germans were forced to go in and clear them, house to house, street to street, taking appallingly high casualties. The Germans were no longer measuring their progress in miles, but feet. The intensity of the fighting turned buildings into rubble and the city into an utter hellscape. One German tank officer said of the devastation, quote, Stalingrad is no longer a town. By day, it's an enormous cloud of burning, blinding smoke. It is a vast furnace lit by the reflection of the flames. And when night arrives, 
one of those scorching, howling, bleeding nights. The dogs plunge into the Volga and swim desperately to gain the other bank. The nights of Stalingrad are a terror for them. Animals flee this hell. The hardest stones cannot bear it for long. Only men endure. End quote. By late September, the Germans controlled the west bank of the Volga, both to the north and south of Stalingrad. The German high command argued to Hitler, with some truth, that the strategic objectives of the campaign had been achieved. They asked him to allow them to cease the attacks on the city that were wasting so many lives. Hitler would have none of it. By this time, capturing the city bearing the name of Stalin had become something of an obsession for him. He was determined to take it, at any cost. When the chief of the general staff of the German high command, General Franz Halder, expressed doubts about this, Hitler sacked him, stating, quote, We now need National Socialist ardor rather than professional ability on the Eastern Front. Obviously, I cannot expect this of you, end quote. He was replaced with Kurt Zeitzler, a sycophant with limited military skill, but who always wrote glowing reports to Hitler, telling him exactly what he wanted to hear, whether it was true or not. The attacks continued through October as the Germans made slow progress while taking appallingly high casualties. To replace their losses, the Germans stripped the well-trained, well-equipped German divisions from the flanks to the north and south of the city. These troops were sent into Stalingrad's urban meat grinder, while their positions on the flanks were taken over by the Germans' Italian, Romanian, and Hungarian allies, who were relatively poorly equipped and trained. This repositioning did not go unnoticed by the Soviet generals, who were already devising plans for a massive winter offensive. The Soviets began massing men and resources for a massive counterattack on the flanks of the city, sparing only a trickle of troops and supplies for the defense of the city itself, just enough to keep it from falling completely into German hands. By the end of October, the Germans reached the Volga in Stalingrad, and controlled roughly 90% of the city. But reconnaissance reports of massive Soviet troop concentrations to the north and south of the city deeply troubled the German commanders. At the start of the campaign, the Germans had believed the Soviets had exhausted their manpower reserves in the previous year's fighting. They realized too late that they had completely underestimated the population and capacity of the Soviet Union to wage total war. One reason for this underestimation is that the Germans assumed when they launched the war that they would only be facing the Soviet men, but the USSR mobilized women for combat as well. While the Western allies, the US and the UK, mobilized their female populations for war work in factories and even for non-combatant roles in the military, the Soviets were the only major combatant in the war to purposefully commit women to a combat role in their army. The Red Army's all-female units were first formed with the idea that the men might fight harder if they were in danger of being shown up by the girls. But at first the army commanders saw them as more of a novelty than anything else. Before long, however, these women warriors proved to be some of the most effective combat troops in the Red Army. Over 800,000 Soviet women would serve as frontline soldiers in the Second World War. I was unable to find any figures that specifically state the number of female military casualties by the Soviets in World War II, but given the nature of the combat they faced, I think it's fair to say that their casualty rates were comparable to the men, which is to say, very high. As the Germans realized their mistake and saw the vast numbers of fresh troops, roughly 750,000, assembling for an offensive, the experienced officers sensed the coming disaster. On November 10th, the commander of German forces inside Stalingrad, Friedrich von Paulus, asked Hitler for permission to withdraw from the city. Hitler forbade any talk of retreat, stating that the city must be taken. He ordered von Paulus to keep attacking. On November 19th, the Soviet counteroffensive began with stunning success. The Soviets smashed and overran the Romanian, Hungarian, and Italian divisions guarding the flanks of Stalingrad and encircled the German 6th Army, trapping them in the city on November 23rd. The assault moved so fast that there was not time to film any of it, and the link-up of the northern and southern armies completing the encirclement would later be reenacted for propaganda newsreels. 
The army trapped in the pocket contained about 265,000 troops, including about 210,000 Germans and about 55,000 Romanians, Italians, Croatians, and Russian collaborators. On November 24th, General von Paulus asked Hitler for permission to break out of the Stalingrad pocket, but Hitler insisted that he hold his position. Instead, he endorsed a plan by Erich von Manstein to launch a counteroffensive to relieve the trapped army at Stalingrad. Nicknamed Operation Winter Storm, this German offensive to relieve Stalingrad began on December 12th. During this time, morale inside the Stalingrad pocket remained high, with the soldiers often repeating the propaganda phrase, quote, hold on, the Fuhrer will save us, end quote. By December 23rd, the Soviets had halted the German advance, but they had pushed to within 48 kilometers, that's about 30 miles, of the Stalingrad pocket. General von Paulus's staff officers begged him to disobey Hitler's orders and order a breakout to link up with Manstein's forces and escape. Von Paulus, however, was a German officer of the old school, and he could not bring himself to disobey a direct order from his superior. Not yet, anyway. A Soviet counteroffensive then pushed Manstein's forces back, taking a link-up or a breakout off the table. Nobody would be coming to the rescue of the German 6th Army. Hermann Göring, the eccentric leader of the German Luftwaffe, or Air Force, and the second man in the leadership of the Nazi state, convinced Hitler that the forces trapped in Stalingrad could be supplied by airdrop. Hitler forbade von Paulus to surrender or attempt to break out of his encirclement, assuring him that the Luftwaffe would drop them everything they needed. Göring's grandiosity was either dishonest or delusional. The German Air Force no longer dominated the skies over Russia, as they had in 1941. Anti-aircraft defenses on the ground had improved, and the Red Air Force was now producing planes and training pilots faster than the Germans could shoot them down. Air supremacy on the Eastern Front was now hotly contested by the Soviets, and even beginning to lean slightly in their favor. Many of the planes sent to the relief of Stalingrad were shot down, and those that made it through dropped their supplies to the Soviets as often as not. They were able to bring only about 10% of what the army needed. The Germans trapped in Stalingrad slowly began to starve and wither away. One German soldier recalled that he and his comrades survived by trapping and eating rats. These same rats sustained themselves by feasting on the corpses of their dead comrades. On top of the onset of starvation, the Russian winter had arrived again. Temperatures now dropped to well below zero. Thousands of German soldiers froze to death or lost limbs from severe frostbite. Finally, the Red Army's bombardment of the Stalingrad pocket was constant. The Germans trapped in the Stalingrad pocket began referring to it as der Kessel, meaning the cauldron. Their morale was decimated as they slowly realized that their only hope of survival was surrender or being severely wounded. A severe enough wound could secure evacuation on one of the few airplanes still flying in and out of the pocket. A number of Germans inflicted wounds on themselves in hopes of getting evacuated on one of these planes. Few were successful. On Christmas Day, the Soviets began employing psychological warfare against the surrounded Germans, projecting a message on a loop that featured a ticking clock and the words in German, quote, Every seven seconds, a German soldier dies in Russia. Stalingrad is a mass grave, end quote. The message looped and repeated all day. On January 8, 1943, the Soviets passed an ultimatum to the German commander von Paulus, demanding the surrender of his troops in the pocket. In return, the Soviets offered food, warmth, and medical care for the German wounded. Von Paulus relayed the ultimatum to Hitler, asking for permission to accept. Hitler refused, stating, quote, Every day Stalingrad holds out, helps our situation everywhere else on the front, end quote. When the offer was refused, the Soviets launched their final assault on the cauldron on January 10th. On January 24th, von Paulus sent a message to Hitler, quote, Troops without munitions or food. Effective command no longer possible. 
Collapse inevitable. Army requests permission to surrender in order to save lives of remaining troops. End quote. Hitler replied, quote, The Sixth Army will do its historic duty at Stalingrad until the last man. End quote. Surrender was forbidden. He was ordering them all to die. By this point, however, disillusioned with the incompetence and inhumanity of Hitler's leadership, droves of German soldiers were already beginning to surrender on their own. A German private, Joseph Schwartz, wrote a letter to his parents on January 15th, just before he surrendered. He wrote, quote, I read the ultimatum, and a burning malice toward our generals boiled up in me. They evidently decided to bury us in this hellish place once and for all. Let the generals and officers fight the war themselves. I'm sick of this. I've had my fill. End quote. On January 31st, Hitler promoted General von Paulus to the rank of field marshal, his logic being that no German field marshal had ever been captured alive. Hitler expected him to commit honorable suicide. Fed up with Hitler's nonsense, von Paulus instead surrendered himself to the Soviets, though he would later dispute that he'd surrendered and claim that he was taken against his will. Pockets of Germans would continue to resist for three more days until the last German resistance was eliminated on February 3, 1943. At last, the guns at Stalingrad fell silent. More than two million people lost their lives on both sides in the Battle of Stalingrad. The Soviets lost more than the Germans, but they had reserves to replace them. The Germans didn't. The Germans also lost enough heavy equipment, including tanks and artillery, to equip a quarter of their army on the Eastern Front. This, perhaps even more than the loss of their men, was a blow from which the Germans could not recover. In 1942, the Soviet Union was still rebuilding their war industry that had largely been destroyed in the German invasion in 1941, and they relied heavily on the Americans to supply their army. Germany never had any hope of matching American productive capacity, but by 1943, the Soviets were outproducing them as well. For example, in 1943, the Soviets produced about 27,000 tanks, while the Germans were able to produce fewer than 12,000. The Germans would never again regain material supremacy on the Eastern Front, or anywhere else for that matter, and would be continuously outgunned for the remainder of the war. The material they lost at Stalingrad was simply irreplaceable. The fighting would continue for more than two years, and the war was not yet won. The Germans were not yet defeated. But after Stalingrad, there was no longer any real possibility of an outright German victory. The best the Germans could hope for was some kind of negotiated solution that would save them from total defeat. But Hitler was beginning to lose his grip on reality, and clung to his delusional belief in final victory. The Western Allied leaders, Roosevelt and Churchill, meanwhile, had met in Casablanca in January and declared that they would accept nothing but unconditional surrender from Nazi Germany. Stalin may have been willing to seek a separate peace in 1941 when he appeared to be losing, and indeed there's evidence that he tried to do just that. Now that he was winning, though, he was as inclined as Roosevelt and Churchill to fight on to the end. Hitler would never surrender. The war would have to continue to its bitter end. That's everything for today. Thank you all for listening. If you haven't already, I encourage you to follow us and engage with us on social media and to visit our website at www.thehistorysphere.com. If you like what you heard, you can support the show by offering us a monthly donation on Spotify. If you don't have Spotify or you prefer to listen elsewhere, you can also support us on Patreon. The link to our Patreon can be found on the website. If you can't afford a donation, you can also support our show by subscribing and giving us a five-star rating on whichever platform you're listening on. This costs you nothing and really helps to promote the show and the algorithm. Next time on the History Sphere, I will continue my narrative of the Second World War as the Red Army marches slowly but inexorably towards victory. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day.